So, hi, I'm Shannon Liu. I am also a first time speaker at an event, so congrats, you get to be a part of that. Uh, so that is why I made my slides purple. Uh, oh, you can't see that actually. This is why I made my slides purple and probably will crack a few jokes. Uh, but yeah, so my name is Shannon Liu. Uh, I'm a senior research operations specialist. I work at IKEA. Uh, I'm based out of Amsterdam and probably you can tell from my accent, I'm originally from the US. Um, so I work in research operations and I'm going to talk about that today, a little bit of intro into research operations for those who haven't heard of it before, and then some of the strategies and relationships. Also, quick note, there's a bit of a, a font change up because of the slides, but ignore it. Um, okay. So also, uh, I wanted to just say when people ask me, so research, research operations is really, really specific. Uh, if people haven't heard of it before, there's probably a reason why. Um, and 90% of the people that I talk to, I'm like, oh, I go, I do a research ops and people aren't really sure. So I, I have started to build this funnel of how I explain it because people don't know if I say, hey, do you know research ops? Usually it's a no. And then I go, okay, then do you know what UX research is? Maybe, sometimes. And then more of the people I go to, okay, then do you know what UX or product design is? And that's generally when people start to kind of nod their heads and stuff. And obviously, you all are UX people, so you hopefully know most of it. Uh, and then I tell them that I work at IKEA, and they think that I deserve design furniture. Uh, I don't. <laughs> Unfortunately, I'm sorry to burst your bubble, but I am part of the product design for the website and the app. Uh, so I work in digital research operations. Um, so, a little bit of an intro into research operations. Um, like Natasha mentioned before, uh, we like to think of the research and design operations as basically the counterpart to the design and research functions. And what that means is we basically do everything that researchers need except the actual research itself. Uh, and so, if you've ever Googled research operations, you've probably seen this chart. Um, this is credit to Kate Towsey and the REOPS community. They created this, I think, like six years ago. Uh, basically, you don't need to be able to read any of this. It is blurry for a reason. Um, there's a ton of words, a ton of pieces, a lot of things within research operations. And as you can see, there's a lot of different pieces to it. And I wouldn't say that I do everything all the time, uh, but you can see how complicated research operations is and the things that you do over time. Um, but, oh, highly recommend looking this up, by the way. Um, research Operations Community, I believe, is the name of the group, and you can just find them on their website. Um, but I am going to talk a little bit more of the things that I do more on a regular basis as someone who works in research operations. Um, so I do do a lot of things in the web, but I would say that as somebody who has done it for a few years, these are probably the subjects that I work on the most. Um, and if you're not familiar, participant recruitment is generally the thing that most researchers are fiending for because it is a really hard thing to do when you have a full-time job as a researcher. Um, and that means finding the right people for your research, you know, doing all the logistics around the research, um, and making sure that you have people to talk to when you're doing your interviews. Governance is a fancy word for data privacy, uh, legal things, things like consent forms, um, making sure that the videos that you're recording and sharing uh, are shared in a very safe way, or people's names are redacted, things like that. Just making sure that you don't get in trouble when it comes to data. Um, tooling, that is something that is also sometimes people think, oh, it's just the digital tools, which shout out to user testings here, I would count that under tooling. Um, and there's also, so this would be digital tools for things like recruitment, um, research repositories, analysis, all different types of the process that you end up doing. But also, I count it as things like setting up a physical lab or finding the right cameras, recording equipment to do things. And then the not as fun part of it, connecting with procurement and finance and all these different uh, parts of your company in order to bring these things into your company. Uh, and then knowledge management, also another fancy word in my opinion at least, uh, mostly goes to research repositories or ways that you're recording the types of research that you're doing, ways that you're organizing it, and also ways that you're sharing it. Um, it's not just putting you know, all of your research in a list, but it's creating a um, culture around it. 
Uh, and then the whole catch-all bucket, I say general operations because there are other things I do when I have time, like you know, developing research education, advocacy, um, a lot of the specific research uh, that I work with ends up taking some more time, like accessibility research and things like that, but I wouldn't say that I do that on a daily basis. Um, and sometimes research operations teams also work on the project management side of things. So sometimes you're recording the research that's going on, you're tracking it, you're doing things over time. Um, but yeah, so I would say that this is more of what I do on a regular basis, um, but the more mature your team is, the more people that you have, the deeper into that previous web that you can get. Uh, and then at the most simple level, I when people don't get it still what exactly I do, I just say, you know what, research operations is a partner to enable you to focus on your craft, which is research. So now that I talked a bit about the intro to research operations, um, I wanted to touch a bit more about some of the types of team structures and relationships that I've been in. Uh, I've been in three or four companies with research operations. They've been big and they've been small, so there's different ways that I've worked within research operations. Um, and I also think the way that a team structure is structured often shows how much impact it can make in terms of the researchers and the people who do, people who do research who may not be researchers as well. So I think the first thing that people think about is team size and makeup. Um, and these two pie charts that I created here, I kind of show as the research ops team, so not including like the researchers and people who are doing the research. Um, and sometimes I say it's a team, <laughs> in quotes, because oftentimes, depending on budget, depending on you know how much time people have, uh, you don't always have a separate team for research ops. Like Natasha, she's 0.5 of a research ops person. Uh, sometimes you get 0.25, um, and sometimes you get nothing, and you just have to kind of do the things yourself. Uh, and unfortunately, with you know budgets and things like that, more often than not, I have been in smaller teams. So I would say maybe one to three people research ops, and then it really depends on the type of researchers, the number of researchers, how many people we're serving when it comes to how many people the team actually has. Um, and yeah, so for smaller teams, I would say a lot of the work ends up being a bit more on the general side because we just don't have time to take care of every single thing. Uh, so it's more focused on enablement of stakeholders, um, which is the researchers. So it's doing things like creating guides, uh, starting processes, automating things, giving the researchers the resources in order for them to do the research themselves, create the consent forms themselves. Um, and also, I think sometimes it's kind of a little bit of a lonely job um, when you're the only research operations person, but then you have a bunch of researchers coming to ask you for things. You have to kind of strategize on your own and figure out what exactly to do on your own because you're a team of one or maybe two. Um, so yeah, it's a bit less collaborative. Um, and then, for example, my team at IKEA, it's quite big. It's about 30-ish researchers. Um, but we have about 200 plus design and content people who also sometimes do research and then product people and engineers too. But the number of research ops people we have is me, my manager, and half of a couple of other people. So we work more on the smaller team side, even though the company itself is gigantic. Uh, the, team, the team and the work that we do is more on the smaller scale. Um, and then the big team side is a bit more spread out. Uh, when you have more people, you can do more things like specializing. People who do recruitment specifically, I think that's the first thing that people generally specialize in. Uh, and then governance, knowledge management, all of the different parts of the research ops process, you can have the opportunity to develop it a bit more. Um, so I also think I've worked in a bigger team as well, and it allows you to do a bit more specialized research as well, because the more resources you have, the deeper you can go, the more mature your team can go as well. Um, but also it's a bit more internal responsibility because people think, oh, you have a team, we're gonna put everything on you, you have to recruit everybody, you have to do everything, you have to do all the consent forms, which normally is fine, um, but sometimes you just don't have the time. Uh, but it is a bit nicer to know that, oh, you have teammates, you have other peers that can do the work and you can collaborate um, and make things a little bit more developed. Uh, so, 
Yeah, the, when I worked, um, I worked at Google for a hot second and I worked in this thing called the research van, which I don't know if you've ever heard of it, but it's essentially a Mercedes Sprinter van that was retrofitted with a lab inside and we would drive around and try to do intercept research because we wanted to uh, increase our diversity because a lot of people, I used to live in San Francisco, a lot of people there are super techie, they all went to college, it's not really a representation of the rest of the world. Uh, so that's something that we did. But I would say I could probably only do it there at a team that has like a hundred plus research ops people. It allows you to do more specialized work. I would like to do that in IKEA. I probably can't because I would be the one driving the van, but also having to do all the other things at the same time. Um, so yeah, I think it really depends on, um, I think this team size and makeup really makes, really uh, develops the strategy for how you're gonna run your team as well. Um, and I didn't touch on this, but you end up working with a lot of agencies and tools as well to kind of fill in the details. Um, but what I focus on here is just specifically people who are hired like, to do research jobs within their teams. Um, another thing that is kind of a hotly debated topic is reporting structure. Uh, I think a lot of people, or I have more often than not been the first one on the left, uh, with research operations rolling up into your research team or being a partner with the research team, and then it's often because researchers are the ones that are like, oh my god, we need help, like we need people to, to come in and do it, so they're the ones that put them onto their team. Uh, and I think there's pros and cons for both. Um, for the research team, I love being really close to researchers. Uh, I really love being in the research field, so to me it's very fun to have the opportunity to kind of see deeper what people are doing. Uh, but also you're more strategically a partner. Um, we would do project management together. We would kind of consult on projects with the research ops and the researchers together. Uh, whereas design operations is the current team that I'm in. Um, we don't report into them. We're actually at the same level, uh, design and research operations. But it's a little bit different because they don't always do the same work that we do because research operations can be a little bit specific and tactical sometimes. Excuse me. Um, so, going with design operations, you guys do the same thing in the sense that you're doing operations uh, and you have feedback, you have peers, you have people around you doing the same thing, but you're, you have different uh, goals. Like, they're not going to be doing recruitment all the time, they're not going to be working data privacy. So, it's nice in terms of getting feedback and you get a lot of resources, you have more connections to people, but then also sometimes we feel like, ah, oh, our goals are not entirely aligned when we do our OKRs, we're not really sure, do we go with this one or do we go with that? Uh, but I think there's benefits to both and it really depends on what your team needs. Um, and then I put a little question mark because there are some interesting research operations teams out there. I haven't been a part of this actually, but some people I've heard do report into things like marketing or product operations. And I think that goes a lot more into the strategy of what the team is that you are serving. Uh, so if the marketing team is doing a lot of the insights and stuff like that, you kind of end up going together. And I think for that, it's mostly just whether or not you have the same goals, if it's gonna work or not. Uh, and I, don't really have too much on that, but I do know that that is kind of, this is kind of a topic that gets uh, changed over and over and over because sometimes you think, oh yeah, we want to be with research, but then you think, oh, we want to be with design and you're not really sure what's going to work best. Um, okay. So I don't have a formula for helping you make that decision. Uh, but I can kind of say a couple of things that I think are pretty good for both. Uh, like I said, design ops it gives you a lot more opportunities, resources. As a research ops person, you need to talk to a lot of different groups of people, and it's really nice to be with design ops. But then research keeps you closer to the work in the projects. It keeps you really, uh, you know the work that's coming up, you know the researchers, you know the things that are going to happen, um, and that's really nice as well. But also centralizing work. centralizing work can create and strengthen other relationships. 
as well. And I say that as in the people to do research side of things. A lot of designers are under design ops, but they don't have as much connection to the research ops people. So being in the same research ops team allows you to reach out to the designers and content people as well and any other ops or not ops functions that you'd be part of. Um, but then, like I said, research can help you develop better research knowledge too. Maybe you came into research operations with not so much of a research background and you're not really familiar with the information. Being part of the research team has really helped me develop uh, deeper research knowledge, basically. So, in conclusion, uh, I don't have the right answer to this. Uh, it's definitely moving around a lot and restructuring is like the only constant I feel in companies. So I have moved back and forth between the two. Um, and I say, unfortunately, the answer is it depends. Um, so yeah, what format of research operations is best for your team really depends on your needs. Like I said, maturity, the team makeup, uh, what exactly are the goals of your research operations team. Um, and I kind of like a bit of both, but personally, I like to be within research because I like to be deep in the research side of things. But it can be a little bit of an island sometimes when you're just the research ops and the researchers. You don't get to see the rest of the part of the process. So it, you guys can think about this one. <laughs> so now that I have talked a bit about research operations and what it looks like in different teams, um, maybe you have thought about starting a team or you've already started a research operations team and you need a bit of push on what to do next. Um, so I'm going to share a few thoughts about what to do when you're starting your research team, what to think about, maybe, and also uh, some of the important aspects of doing so. So advocating for research ops, once again, like Natasha said, advocating for ops is super important, um, but maybe these pointers can help you a little bit for how to start. Uh, if you don't, if you're not already convinced that you need research ops, please look at this. Um, but if you need something to tell people like your stakeholders or people that are on the management side of things that probably have more control over this information, these are good ways to think about it. Um, I think about the value add for business and project perspectives. And what I mean by that is money at the end of the day and time and time is money. Um, and when I say money, I mean like making sure that you have the right research uh, done, the types of um, organizations that you're working with, you're making good deals with uh, teams, or sorry, companies and agencies, um, and making sure that you're being a bit more efficient when it comes to projects, because when you're doing research and you're doing research jobs at the same time, I like to make the joke that it's kind of like using a spork. <laughs> you're doing both kind of, but not any of them really well, uh, and this frees up some of your time to do both well, because you can do the research and you don't have to spend your time in the ops. Um, also, oh, and I just said the second point, but also more space for research and development. I think a lot of the times when you don't have a research operations team, you end up spending way too much time on ops, you end up spending way too much time worrying about all the sides of the things that you have to do, and you don't really think, you don't really get to think about the research side of things. Um, and then the last point is um, potential for growth and scale and maturity of your team. And I say that because there's a lot of waiting around if your ops are not to put together. And in that sense, I mean, if you don't know how to recruit, you're gonna spend a lot of time recruiting. If you don't have a consent form, you're gonna spend a lot of time talking to legal and data privacy and things like that. And so everything just moves a lot more slower, or a lot slower. Um, so when you have a research ops team, when you have someone else to take that from you, it allows you to grow and scale the maturity of your team. And if all of those things don't convince people, I also then go to the negative side of what if you don't have research ops? Then it's that same slide that I had earlier, but a lot of the bad parts of it. So yeah, wrong participants, maybe someone's going to sue you for data privacy, you don't have the tool maintenance, your repository is like 30 years old, you don't really have organized research, and that is maybe sometimes more of a way to convince your uh, managers that they need more research ops people. Whatever works, I guess. 
So starting with implementation, um, people also, when you're convinced, you're like, okay, I do want to have a research ops team or I want to grow my research ops team. These are some of the things that I like to think about. Uh, when, well, if you're already drowning in work, it's too late in my opinion, but generally that is when research ops people come in. Um, and I actually think that I'm on the side that you should hire research ops when you hire research, a research team because culture is hard to change. Researchers are quite independent people. They're used to doing work themselves. They're also used to maybe academia, things like that. So trying to start a culture of a research team and then bringing in research operations later and trying to redo the culture is a lot more work than just bringing it in from the beginning if you have the research resources and the means. Or if you cannot, like I said, when you hit a maturity wall, when you're at a really tight part of the funnel, bring in the research jobs. How I say start with intention and set expectations for your team. Uh, researcher researchers first. Everybody is like, oh my god, we need research operations because we need recruitment. Yeah, but doesn't necessarily mean that you need to hire a recruiter right away. I think it helps more to ask everybody around, create a strategy around what you actually need. Ask your researchers because I did this once before I asked my researchers, oh, what do you need for a research operations team? And they listed all these things and then I told her, I was like, actually, you, did you know that I could do you know, X, Y, and Z other things? And she was like, what? Research operations does this? So I think it's, it's very helpful to start and talk first and then make decision on what exactly you need. Because maybe you don't just need a recruiter. Maybe you need somebody who does a lot more than that. Uh, why, at the end of the day, I say is you don't have to do it all yourself. Uh, I think that's the biggest complaint, that researchers start going to the research field because they like research, but they don't want to be negotiating contracts with vendors, they don't want to be arguing with finance, they don't want to talk to data privacy for hours, that's not what they signed up for, and so this helps set your team up for success. Your projects will go much faster and more smoothly if you have someone else who can do it instead of you, because they actually signed up for that job. So lastly, about research teams, whether you're thinking about your first research ops, research ops hire or looking to mature an existing team, there's always opportunities for growth. I haven't been a part of the process of hiring a research ops team, because obviously when someone asks for one, I come after. But I have been part of a process of developing a team or asking my researcher friends, what do you look for in research ops? What do you need? Do you need research ops? Um, so it doesn't matter where you are on the part of the process. There's always opportunities for growth. And with that, that is the end of my presentation. That is my face. Um, I learned the QR code LinkedIn thing also from Natasha, so this is my contact information, and if you really care, I love spicy food, petting dogs, and eating, eating oh, enjoying outdoor sports uh, in my free time. Thank you. Another first time presenter who done a wonderful job. Thank you. Um, do we have any questions for Shannon on research jobs specifically? At the back. Okay. Any other hands whilst I'm walking? Yeah, it was just a quick question about the Google research ah. plan. <laughs> what was that? Sorry? What was it? Uh, it was yeah. essentially um, put together to help reach more uh, participants, basically. Like I said, San Francisco, if you've ever been, it's super techie. And so it's not really, every all the results that people were getting were very skewed towards people who know their technology quite well. Um, so the point of the van was we actually drive out farther than San Francisco and we bring the lab to people and we do like a intercept testing basically. So we just grab people from the street, ask them if they want to talk to us for 10, 15 minutes and you already get different results just leaving the Bay Area for like two hours away. Uh, and then annually we used to do like, um, a road trip around other states as well because it's hard to reach those people without actually traveling to them. Um, but this was pre-pandemic. Uh, I don't think it's a thing now anymore um, because obviously nobody was traveling anywhere in 2020 and I don't know if they picked it back up. But um, yeah, that was the original goal, just to diversify the results a bit more. Thanks for expanding. Um, any other questions? Oh, one more in the back. Oh, and another here. Okay. Yeah, 
Yeah, it's very insightful talk, thanks. Um, and I think like when you say that like, you have no research ops and researchers end up having this, in terms of you outsource to agencies, you manage relationship with vendors yourself and things like that. But there's also like overlap with designers who also sometimes also look at the, those relationships. So when you literally don't have resources, let's say for ops in any ways, but how would you recommend splitting those kind of different components that you've shown uh, between design and managers and researchers and maybe just outsourcing as well? Uh, and are you talking about within a research team or just like a design team, you know, that's make of product design researchers and yeah. you know, sometimes you have overlap where you know, designers might use like a, or a manager might take care of the relationship with, you know, user testing or other vendors, but yourself, you might deal with the regular agency and then, you know, it's just like a bit like spread out. Yeah, uh, I think one thing that's very common, actually a lot of people stumble into research ops because they're usually doing another job first and then they get to do research ops because of a need. Um, so I think one of the first things you can do is look into your company like some recruiters, if they can recruit people for your company, they can also probably recruit you know, people to do your interviews if they have the time. Um, but if you can't bring people from other parts of the company, I generally say to try to have people own parts of the process. So you don't have to feel like, oh, this one person is doing all the ops, but this person is creating templates, this person is putting together the knowledge management, this person is helping look into vendors, and this person is doing something else. So you all are still spending time on the research ops, but you're not spending all of your time on your own ops, and you can kind of work together as a sort of team, like I said, the 0.25 research ops people. Um, but yeah, I think those are probably the easiest thing to do if you cannot convince somebody to pay somebody else to do the work. Uh, but, oh, sorry, you said agencies as well. Agencies, I think it depends on the company too. Um, for me, like we have a really big company, so getting an agency really quickly is actually quite difficult. We can't just pay anybody to do things. We have to go through like a zillion month long um, procurement process. Um, but if you have a smaller company, I do highly recommend agencies um, and I would not pay anybody to do anything definitely do research there's a lot of resources out there for you know who are good agencies for what kinds of projects and things like that um, and also good to understand what parts of the process you want to outsource like if you can't handle the recruitment okay fine but if you can handle the rest of it like doing the, the actual interviews and things like that then maybe you can split it and it's not as expensive as you know, spending money on a really big $50,000 project or something. Um, but yeah, I think that's generally what I try to do. Thank you very much. Yeah. We have one last question. Hey, Shannon. Hey. Uh, so I have a doubt, not a doubt, but I'm a little bit more curious about your participant recruitment, mm. which you spoke about. So I kind of want to know how much influence uh, you would have on how you choose the participants, because a lot of businesses you spoke about have a global scale to them. And which is one example of San Francisco, you said how you have to travel two hours to go get at least some different opinions on things. So when you talk about companies like IKEA or even Google, they have a very global scale, but how much of it, like how much of the process do you focus on trying to make it more region specific if it's for a country or even for a city like based on the projects like how do you do you guys have influence on that I just, i'm just curious yeah um so for this i would say i actually lean more on the researchers or the people who are doing the research um because a lot of the researchers have backgrounds and you know making sure that they have the right participants they kind of have the uh, what is it, like the, the people map or something of knowing like, oh, this region has this type of person, this region has this type of person, we need to diversify. So a lot of the researchers are, like, we come, research ops comes into part of the process after sometimes, but also could be part of the consulting process. I actually prefer the, the latter, um, but I would say I lean more on the researchers when it comes to the expertise there, and then I kind of go in and be like, oh, well, are you sure that this gender split is good or do we want to try X, Y, and Z? Um, I also think research ops is important for that when it comes to uh, having trouble finding people, actually. Because I think sometimes you think ideally, oh yeah, I want to find these penguin researchers from Antarctica. 
but there's like five of them in the world and you can't actually find them very easily, but sometimes researchers or people who do research don't know, especially people who are not researchers by a trade. Uh, they think like, oh, we, this is our audience, we need them, let's do that. Um, and I think research jobs, sometimes I come in and I'm, I'm like, eh, well, we can't actually reach these people. You know, you have a screener, right? Let's take out two or three questions here and maybe make this thing more general and stuff. So I would say I'm more consulting on that side of things. Like, I, I wouldn't say I'm a pro in, like, the type of cultures that we should put in all of our research, but I can help you get there, basically, as research jobs. Thank you once again for all your questions. Uh,